Uh, today we have Dr. Ku Seng Wu. Uh, Dr. Wu is an associate professor in the Department of uh, Geography and Sustainability at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Uh, he is also the Google yep. developer expert uh, for the Earth Engine and the visiting academic at Amazon. Uh, Dr. Wu research uh, lies in utilizing big geospatial data and cloud computing platform to study environmental change. Uh, he's an industry leader and well known for his contribution to uh, various geospatial open source packages such as GE Map, Leaf Map, and now the latest uh, segment geospatial, SAM Geo. Uh, today he will be talking the SAM Geo package, uh, which helps with automated segmentation of satellite imagery with a meta segment anything model. Uh, he'll showcase the uh, how SAM Geo allows for interactive segmentation uh, together and its integration with the Google Earth Engine. Uh, th thank you to Dr. Wu for agreeing to talk to the working group. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Ku Seng Wu. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Wu. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you a bit love for the uh, introduction and also the invitation. I'm uh, uh, here to uh, present some of the work that I've been doing the past couple of months um, based on the segment geospatial model. And the slides, uh, the link to the slides I sent in the chat, uh, you can also scan a QR code uh, at the lower right corner. So the title is Automatic Segmentation of uh, Remote Sensing Imagery with uh, the Segment Anything Model. And here's the outline. So I will uh, first introduce the segment NEC model. Uh, you might have heard about this one or uh, see it on social media, but I will give you kind of the uh, overview of what uh, the same is. Then I will um, um, highlight uh, how same can be used to segment uh, geospatial data, specifically uh, remote sensing imagery. Um, and uh, I will also show you like how you can use that with Google Sensing and using GMAP. At the end, we show you some additional uh, resources. So segment anything uh, model, uh, if you want to try it out, you can uh, take, a look, take a look at the link uh, upper right corner here. And this is more like a demo. So essentially, give an imagery. Uh, it's going to segment that for you uh, into basically a uh, mask or objects. And then you can uh, extract the object to do all kind of a uh, calculation, or uh, if you want to. So first, let's uh, get into the segment energy model. Uh, so it's uh, the definition uh, from the paper. Uh, so SAM is a promotable segmentation system with zero sort generalization to unfamiliar objects and images uh, without the need for additional training. So zero sort basically means that. Uh, you don't need to do training. So uh, based on the model, it can be used to uh, basically do the inference uh, on any other images. So this is kind of similar to the um, check GPT. Uh, it's the so-called foundation model. That means you can train your model and then have a foundation model and then you can use the model to do prediction uh, on images, text, video, something like that uh, without having to um, do additional training. And it was released by uh, Meta AI on April, uh, April 5th, so uh, roughly uh, a little bit more than four months ago. And it's a very short period of time, but they, if you are on social media, you probably have seen a lot of applications based on SAM. So it's not just on geospatial, there are tons of other applications, also in the computer vision world, in medical, um, um, in the tech industry, or even in geospatial. So there are a lot of new applications uh, are be, being built on top of the same model. And it's, uh, it's basically revolutionized the way that we do segmentation and makes things so much easier. Um, so I highly recommend, uh, if you have not done that, uh, check out the website, segmentdaysanything.com. They also have a paper here, um, but today I will basically show you the highlights uh, of the paper and how, what uh, Sam can do. Uh, besides the model, uh, the other one that's very, um, um, uh, important is their data set. So they also release the data set that they use to build the model. So that makes things more accessible and reproducible because 
uh, this a huge data set that's um, very useful for all kind of um, um, computer vision uh, tasks. And also I have a demo in here. At the bottom shows you um, more like the, um, the, the framework uh, of SAM. So basically you have task uh, is to uh, get the prompts. So basically you can, imp I will talk about more data, like you can use point, uh, polygon, you can use mass, you can use even use text. And then with that, uh, you can um, basically um, use the model to do segmentation. And so the last part is uh, the data set. So it's called SA1B, so segment anything, uh, one billion mask. So they uh, have a lot of data set that you can use even to fine tune the model, uh, you can do that um, as well. And so this is the model architecture. Uh, you have the so-called image encoder. So basically you give an imagery, uh, it's going to basically do something and then convert uh, to something uh, that you can basically uh, rep representation um, of the imagery. And then so you have prompt coming from point uh, bounding boxes and text also to the encoder. And then after that, it's going to export uh, a three mass. So basically giving imagery, uh, some kind of black box inside and then output three mass. Uh, so each mass has a score. Uh, I will show you some examples later uh, because uh, segmentation sometimes you might, for example, you when you're trying to extract, for example, a car, right? You can, if you place a point on the map, or on the imagery, it can be maybe a wheel, a window, or do you want the entire car, or do you just want the window or multiple windows, right? So there basically some ambiguity. And the reason that uh, they want to expose three masks is sometimes you might, you can choose from uh, different masks. And so the model is actually uh, pretty big. So 632 million parameters uh, for the image encoder and for the prompt and the mask decoder, it's four million parameters. Um, on the right here also shows you more like animation. So it, how it's actually doing. So giving imagery and then uh, have the image encoder and then do the embedding and then integrate with the uh, prompt uh, encoder. Uh, eventually you're going to have the mask. Uh, nice thing about this is that you don't have to like understand everything or need just call the API and uh, giving imagery, call the API and then generate the mask. So it's uh, relatively easy to use. Uh, you don't need to do training, um, very nice. And next I'm gonna show you different uh, um, ways that you can segment the imagery. So the first one is called um, fully automatic segmentation. Uh, again, you can try out the link uh, upper right corner here. Uh, if you, you can use some of the sample imagery or you can also use the, you can upload on imagery uh, you like. And so once you upload imagery, uh, there are different modes that you can do the segmentation. Um, so the first one, I will start with the first one, just the everything. So this is why it's called segment anything. Basically, you can give any imagery, you can do the segmentation. If you don't know what you want to choose from, you just want to segment the entire image. This is called fully automatic segmentation. So essentially, it's going to give an imagery and then generate uh, a 32 by 32 uh, grid uh, of points. And then with the points, and then you just want to segment the imagery and then repeat. We uh, remove the duplicate, and this is what is ending up here. Right, like you have all the horses, uh, you have the sky, you have the mountain, you have the grass, and then um, 32 by 32 uh, grid of points is going to reduce only to a smaller number of objects. And you see those points are being highlighted in here, and then kind of similar to the, in the past, uh, the computer like region growing. Right, so we have a point, and then it's going to grow from the uh, from the point, and then to the outside. And then once you have the objects, gradually uh, some of the objects will be merged and then reduced. And this is what uh, we end up having this is um, fully automatic uh, segmentation. Um, and also the result, uh, you basically is a mask. So it's going to depend on how many objects you have on the imagery, it's going to uh, export uh, the same number of uh, a mask. And so basically you can think about it's a NumPy array, um, the same rows and columns and each object is the the same shape and then after that if you want to merge them together uh, you can do that so this is the fully automatic segmentation uh, the next one is called a point uh, using a point as input prompt so you can do that uh, interactively uh, what you can do basically is just click your mouse on the map and then it's going to select uh, the object uh, depends on but there will be three masks being output uh, this one by default it only shows the one with the highest score um, because 
if you only have one point, it's going to guess like what you want, right? So um, sometimes if it's not what you want, um, you can do, you can uh, extract the mask you want programmatically uh, because you can have three masks. So the, the image here only shows you, the demo only shows you uh, one mask. So you can pick whatever you want and then you're going to extract. Again, all the output can be exported as a mask. And so this is also called a foreground, uh, means the point you want. But sometimes if it also uh, accidentally extracts some of the point uh, area that you don't want, uh, then on the left side here, you can like remove area. So you can place your marker on area that you don't like, and then it's going to just remove those area. Um, it's kind of more like interactive process, um, but everything you can do that programmatically uh, if you want. Next one is the bounding boxes. Uh, so bounding boxes mean that you can just draw a rectangle around an object, and then it's going to uh, segment the object you want. So in this case, right, it's not perfect, but you get the idea uh, because there are multiple masks. Uh, you can certainly uh, add uh, bounding boxes. Uh, in the meantime, you can also add points, uh, foreground points and background points. So basically, you can use a combination of uh, prompts uh, to do the segmentation and uh, keep in mind, uh, so the bounding boxes here, uh, if you want to use that programmatically, keep in mind the origin is from the upper left corner. So it's the top left corner. And so when you're trying to enter this into the program, it's basically the row and column number. So it's X and Y. Uh, X would be just the, uh, the column number, and then Y would be the uh, row number. And then it's counting from the top left um, because it's, it's a bit confusing if you're using in the in, in geospace. So most of the time we are counting the pixel from the uh, lower left corner to the upper right corner. But it's the, in this case, it's the top left. So you need to make sure that the row uh, and color number are correct when you enter into that. Uh, I will give you some examples later when we talk about geospatial uh, because I, in the same geo package, I already automate. So you don't have to worry about like what's the row number, what's the column number, because you can just uh, create those bounding boxes interactively just like this uh, showing here on uh, this demo. And uh, the last one is using text uh, as input prompts. Uh, so if you're giving imagery, you can just describe what you want, uh, the object, the features. Uh, the demo here shows you the cat, right? So give you an image uh, with a lot of cats. You just type cat, and then it's going to um, segment uh, the cats based on the basic thing about the bounding boxes. So the, with the text, it's going to extract um, the bounding boxes, and then with the bounding boxes, it's going to pass into the same to do the segmentation. So more like uh, the input in here. So it's multiple steps. So this one is passing just the bounding boxes. Uh, this one, the text prompt extensively is just creating the bounding boxes and then use that to uh, do the segmentation. Uh, I have to point out that, so for text segmentation, same does not, it, it, in the paper, it said it was uh, explored in the paper, but it was not released. So basically, Sam cannot do this one directly. So you cannot ask the same models like give a cat and then you do the second test. No, you need to extract the bounding boxes using other algorithm and then use that. You have the row and column number. So you have a bunch of bounding boxes. Then you can use that to pass into the same model. So one of the uh, package that can do this is called grounding dyno. So you are welcome to check out this one on GitHub. And I actually created a PyPI package and also put it on Conda first to make it easier to use because uh, same Geo also use this package. So it's a dependency. And so previously, they also only provided on GitHub. You cannot install directly from uh, uh, PyPI or Conda. So I spent some time to delete it. And um, luckily, um, everything right now is available. So it's actually much easier to use. If you're using, um, same geo is already included, so you don't have to uh, manual inst manually install uh, on your own. So those are the three different modes. So points, um, bounding boxes, and text. Uh, but text basically is the bounding boxes and um, depends on the bounding boxes. And so the output would be something like this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, right? So if you just place one marker on the, uh, on, on the image, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. So in this case, uh, you will see on the on the first column here, uh, this column, it's going to output three masks. And depends on uh, the feature you want, you can pick the mask that you want. Uh, so for example, this is entire object. This is just the, without the uh, the feet. 
and this is just the uh, the head, right? So similarly, right, when it's a person, individual with a backpack, when you place a marker, you can you can just a backpack, or it can be the entire person with the backpack, or it's just a, a small uh, region of the backpack. So this means that uh, there's some ambiguity, but you can control what you want. And this is just one example. Uh, of course, you can place multiple markers. Uh, if you only have one one marker, is more ambiguous. If you have more, it's going to be less ambiguous. So the more points you have, the more likely you're going to be able to extract the object you want. So you can place multiple markers as the foreground. You can also place multiple markers as the background. So in that way, uh, it's more uh, accurate. And uh, keep in mind that, so the same model does not produce mass labels. So essentially, it doesn't know it's a cat, it's a dog, or it's a human, it's, it doesn't know. So you have to utilize other deep learning models to be able to recognize the object. So same essentially, just secondly, uh, object uh, image into regions, into objects, it doesn't know what it is. So human, we need to attach the label to those objects. And so, those are kind of the brief overview of the same model. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there's also the uh, SAB1 data set, uh, segment anything uh, 1 billion um, um, data set. And in total, it has 11 million images. Uh, so they're all high resolution images. And so each image, uh, they have some mass. And so it's overall, they have 100 mass per image. So they have a lot of images, uh, 11 million, and each image is going to have some uh, objects. So basically already do the segmentation and in total it has 1.1 billion high quality segmentation tasks. You can look at some of these images in here, right? So the images are, are collected uh, around the globe uh, in different regions, different countries, and all high resolution, but they are not geospatial, okay? So it, you can still see the, uh, the, the, the images, see the object, but they are not the traditional remote sensing imagery uh, from satellite, from area imagery. It's more like um, very high resolution uh, imagery. But the model it builds can actually uh, do a decent job on second and um, area imagery, high resolution uh, imagery. I will show you examples uh, later. So this also shows you the geographic distribution of um, their training data. So it was collected in different continents, different country. Uh, you will see on the right in here, basically the histogram. So uh, overall, 1,000 images per country. So basically some of the images from one country, other images from the other country, and overall in total, yes, uh, 11 million. And so the model was trained on 256A100 GPUs uh, for three to five days. So uh, this is very computationally intensive, and it's not something that um, um, each of us can do because this, uh, you need a lot of GPU and money and resources to be able to train the model. And once you have the model, then you can use it just to do uh, inference without having to retrain the model. So this is why uh, the second management model is very powerful because um, users don't have to train. That, you know. And uh, again, so the source code is available on GitHub. Um, you can install using GitHub, but I also created a PyPI package um, because uh, if you want to include this one as a dependency, you cannot just simply install it uh, from GitHub because you need to put into your package. So I had to actually create uh, the package on PyPI and also uh, make it available on Conductboard. So now you can actually install this uh, with just one line of code and with all the dependencies uh, included. Uh, you can check out uh, the GitHub repo that I created. And so next, let me quickly uh, show you how actually you can use that. So same model, you can think about it's a foundation model. So it's a model, basically you can think about the black box, give an image, pass into black box, do something, and then output the three um, masks. So this black box has three different um, uh, types, um, V, I, T, H, L, and also B. You can, it's also called a model checkpoint. So essentially, uh, this model checkpoint contains um, uh, millions of parameters inside. Um, the first one uh, is the biggest one, 2.5 gigabyte, and the second one is 1.2 and then 358. So by default, usually we use the first one because it's the most comprehensive and usually give the uh, best result, but it's pretty computationally intensive. So 
this is a model 2.5 gigabyte. So when if you want to use that, you need to have a GPU to be able to do that. So the GPU is need to be several times of the model. So 2.5 gigabyte, you need to load into the GPU. And then with the imagery, you need to have a lot of intermediate results. So your GPU definitely you need to have like at least maybe uh, eight gigabyte or four. Four probably is not enough. So eight gigabyte of the GPU to be able to actually handle the model. And um, but there are free resources, for example, on Google Cloud that they can uh, utilize. But this is basically uh, the model that is needed if you want to do the segmentation. Uh, you can think about if you need to retrain the model, eventually you will have something like this. Uh, but this makes it easy for other people to use because you can just call the API, pass the imagery, convert to NumPy, passing, and then get the output, and then you can save um, the mask. Also, the same can basically have two um, uh, different modes that you can do the segmentation. So automatic mass generator, uh, you can see here basically import the image, uh, the segment energy model, and then figure out what the model type. So the model type is from here, like VITH, and then the checkpoint. So the checkpoint, if you already downloaded to a computer, you can pass the file pass to the checkpoint. And so same basically going to load the model checkpoint into GPU, and then passing, you're going to create the automatic mass uh, generator, and then use the generate function to generate images. So basically image encoder and then prompt. Uh, this is fully automatic. Um, so basically using 32 by 32 uh, a grid of points and then just do the segmentation. The second one is called predictor. Predictor basically you you tell the algorithm uh, the prompts. So that basically you just point and bounding boxes. So you can uh, the points, the label and the bounding boxes. So the structure is pretty much the same. But this one, once you have the model, you only need to set the imagery and then just predict based on your prompts. More specifically, if you want, you can look at the um, UC's example, the functions on the right, right? So the first one is called the drain rate function. You provide an image NumPy array, and then the output is going to be a list uh, of three masks. Um, uh, and also you can do the predict, but this one provide more uh, parameter for you to customize, right? So the points, uh, basically the NumPy array, so the point basically is X and Y, X and Y, X and Y. So it's a list of points. So each point is basically the row, uh, the column number and the row number. And then you can press a match of points. And then also the, uh, the label corresponding with the points. Is it a foreground or is it a background? So it's one or zero, one or zero, something like that. And then the bounding boxes. It's a list of bounding boxes. So basically, uh, in this case, it's just one. Uh, basically, the x1, y1, x2, y2, so based from the upper left corner. And there's some other parameters you can uh, make adjustment. But this is basically the uh, essentially how you use the same model um, to do segmentation using the imagery that you want, uh, if you can do that programmatically. And, and that's it. So this is the kind of overview of the segment agency model. And it has a lot of applications. People are applying to, for example, do medical uh, imaging uh, segmentation, uh, do object tracking, do video checking. There are tons of applications out there. So, and I created a segment uh, um, geospatial uh, package, but that one was inspired by the other GitHub user. Um, if you see on the left, uh, lower left uh, here, uh, Ari Sandra. Uh, so inspired by his work, and I actually uh, built on top of uh, his uh, source code, uh, and then created a Python package and made it available on PyPI and also Condaver. So it's so much easier to uh, to use. Um, starting, I think, in uh, late August, uh, late April. So it's only uh, three or four months uh, old. So it's pretty, still pretty new, but. Uh, I integrate those with some of the packages that I developed, for example, LeapMet, to have a lot of interactive components. So in that way, I mean, uh, even new users, uh, you, you can use that uh, without having difficulties. You can just run that on Google Collab and then try it out. And so you can basically run it anywhere that you have Jupyter uh, installed. So it can be Google Collab, um, uh, Jupyter Lab, or uh, SageMaker Geospatial uh, Environment. And similarly, you can use pip install or you can use mamba install. Uh, mamba usually is recommended um, because the package need to use PyTorch and you need to have GPU. So if you already have uh, uh, mamba or conda can handle GPU pretty uh, easily. So you will be able to figure out if your computer has GPU and has driver, 
then you want to install the GPU version. Uh, you can use the CPU, but it's going to take a while when you do the segmentation or when you load the model uh, into your uh, the, the RAM. So highly recommend um, use the Mamba. Uh, you can check out the link here for more information about the segmentation. So next, I'm going to show you some of the key features. Um, in this presentation, I will not go into in depth about how to write a call, how to do that. So every demo I'm showing here, uh, there's a notebook uh, at the top. So you're welcome, just click the notebook and then you can run the notebook on Google Collab or you can download to your computer if you have a GPU that can uh, run the segmentation. So the first one is similar to the fully automated uh, mass generator that Sam has. Um, but this one handles the sp geospatial data. So uh, all you need just give me a GeoTIFF and then it's going to segment the, uh, the, the image into different objects. The output will also be a GeoTIFF. So basically it's geo reference. And uh, besides that, um, the package also have a couple of tools that can help you do the visualization. For example, the slider tool that you uh, saw uh, at the end. So it have basically makes it so much interactive rather than you just export it and then you have to open it uh, to compare using other tools. So it's all uh, integrated. So this is using the automatic uh, mask. The workflow is pretty much the same. So you just uh, find out, have the imagery, you can download the imagery from uh, online or you can use your local imagery and then just load the same model into uh, the GPU, the RAM, and then use that to do the segmentation. So same outputs, a list of masks, uh, but those masks are without geo reference. So basically under the hood, uh, same geo, export the, the NumPy array savvy as an imagery and then attach all the geo reference from the original imagery. Um, you can also export the imagery, uh, the result as vector data. So you have basically, you can choose whether you want raster or you want vector. Uh, so it's all uh, possible through the packaging. And so next I'm going to show you a couple more examples. Uh, so this one is using, for example, segment buildings. Uh, so these are all the uh, greenhouses, for example, and then you can just segment. It does pretty nicely. Uh, again, the same model doesn't know it's buildings, the greenhouses, uh, they're all just objects. Um, but once you do the segmentation, you can do some post-processing uh, to assign the label, attach the label to the uh, object. And also, for example, uh, um, agricultural uh, field boundaries. So in this case, there are a lot of uh, uh, sensor pivot irrigation objects. So people are interested, for example, finding out the field boundary. And this might be quite challenging by using traditional pixel-based uh, classification, but uh, it can be done pretty easy using the uh, same model. Again, the notebook is there if you want to try it out. So next, let's talk about some other uh, different uh, input prompts. So as I mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the same introduction, so you have points, uh, you have polygon uh, mounting boxes, you also have text. Uh, in this case, you can just simply use the same geo uh, load imagery and then it's just uh, show the uh, interactive GUI. Then you can just simply uh, choose the point you want. So similar to earlier when you pick the whole sheet, right? You uh, place your marker on the on the imagery and then it's going to uh, create a so-called foreground. So the, when you create use the foreground, you want to basically you get the code when you place your marker on the map. It's going to get the coordinate. So basically the uh, um, the coordinate uh, latitude and the longitude and also the label, right? So if this fourth ground is label is one, if this background the label is um, zero. So under the hood, uh, same geo basically convert your latitude and longitude to row and column number um, because the same geo, uh, same package only accept X, Y. So the row and column, it cannot deal with latitude and longitude. So same geo under the hood basically automatically convert all your markers from latitude and longitude to X, Y row and column based on the imagery. Uh, you can think about this is actually not very straightforward because your image can have different resolution, different uh, reason, different extent. It's going to change based on the imagery. So even the same location, the same latitude, longitude, you're going to have different row and column number for different imagery. And this is automated, so you don't have to worry about uh, how to figure out the row and column number. And it, you can do automatic conversion. If you already have a, a uh, points, you can also open um, the marker on your computer and then just uh, convert it automatically to the points. So essentially, you can create markers automatically 
interactively, or you can load mark from a point shape file or point geojson, whatever um, vector data you want, and then it's going to have foreground and background. So that in that way, you can do the segmentation. And one thing I will point out here is that you might notice when you place the marker, so you don't have to place marker on all the buildings, right? You will see in the middle here, I don't have those buildings, but um, you also uh, um, have some of the area that you don't want, for example, the rows, and then you just place the uh, full uh, uh, background, then you will remove those objects. So this makes it really useful. Basically, you, you give an imagery, you just need to pick a couple of points, you don't need all of them, and then you will do the rest. Uh, or, uh, but the result might not be perfect. You can always always add more foreground and add some um, background points. So that's for the point. The next one is the bounding boxes. Uh, actually, I just, I think we did this one uh, on Monday. Um, it took me a while actually to implement. It looks pretty easy, but I don't know it's, it's a lot of uh, 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 processing because you when you get the bounding boxes, you want to get the coordinates and then you're going to change for all the bounding boxes uh, as a, a list because the same um, model, the original one only accept one bounding boxes, but you also have some API allow you to have multiple bounding boxes. And then so under the hood, same geo, uh, convert all the bounding boxes, uh, the coordinates into row and column number, and then passing into the API and then generate the result. Uh, so in that way, basically this is more like a batch processing. So you can do multiple bounding boxes all together. And you can either draw the bounding boxes interactively on the map, or you can just use any existing vector data. So if you already have, for example, have some building, have some tree, you already know the rough area of the object you want to add uh, to um, segment, then you can just uh, read the, the vector data, and then you will automatically uh, create the bounding boxes around each object. And then you can just passing basically, basically the same API is just either but the bounding boxes is just passing a file pass to your to your vector data. That's it. You don't need to um, do any uh, additional data processing. And this is very useful because uh, you might have some output from other deep learning models. So for example, from grounding dyno or from any other traditional machine learning uh, deep learning models that most of them usually generate bounding boxes. So you have the bounding boxes, uh, you can directly use that to do segmentation based, uh, based on same. So basically refine, right? So bounding boxes is, is a good starting point, but sometimes you will want the perfect segmentation of the object, then you might want uh, to use the same to do that. So again, this is good. Uh, you segment the trees, same doesn't know it's trees. Uh, it's just a bunch of objects. So the next one is more interesting is using the text prompts. So this one is under who using grounding dyno. Uh, so basically convert the imagery into NumPy array and then use grounding dyno. You can enter the text, you want to interpret the text and then set, uh, figure out the object and then could generate the bounding boxes. Then we have to use the bounding boxes to pass into the same model. Then in that way, you basically, you have the label, right? So um, this makes it really useful because you don't have to manually assign the label. You can do a segmentation for a large area, for example, trees, buildings, uh, swimming pool, anything like that. Uh, again, this is not perfect. Don't expect that you can just type something and then get the perfect result for everything. Sometimes you still have to do the fine tuning. So, but this you can at least give you uh, initial results that you can use to uh, fine tune the result. You can run the same multiple times. For example, you get this one, and you can generate the bounding boxes and then pass the bounding boxes back again into the same model, or you can generate the markers, uh, foreground, background, based on some existing data set, and then you can use that to do a segmentation. Um, but it still saves a lot of time because you don't have to change the model. Uh, not everyone has the skills to actually to uh, change the model and then the validation, uh, validate the model and then use that to do production. So this is uh, uh, very pretty useful. So the next example, for example, uh, swimming pool, right? So just type swimming pool, grounding dyno, grab all the swimming pools on the imagery and then get the bounding boxes, pass the bounding boxes back uh, to the same model. Uh, then you can use that to do segmentation and you can save the result as a GeoTIFF. Uh, you can also, use, uh, there's a function uh, option called uh, regularize. So sometimes when the object is extracted, uh, the, the shape is very irregular. 
for building, swimming pool, and other types, sometimes it's very regular. So you can also uh, just turn on the regularized function uh, or parameter. And then so when you export the result, uh, you will get a polygon that's regularized. So it's much nicer uh, if you are trying to extract some regular objects. Again, it's all automated and you can use the interface or you can try the notebook. Everything is, should be available. Uh, you can run it on Google Colab or uh, Amazon SageMaker, or if you have a GPU, you can do that locally. And you can try it in your area, the region you want, the area you want. I uh, provide an example that makes it reproducible, but it, you can do that on any imagery. Uh, any area imagery, um, you can find it online. There are tons of resources that uh, you can uh, use to do uh, segmentation. And the last one is for a uh, batch segmentation because as I mentioned uh, earlier, so the same model is 2.5 gigabyte, it's pretty big. So you need to have a decent GPU to be handle large imagery. If you have a, a remote sensing imagery that's like one gigabyte, it's probably not going to work um, because it's a large area, it's high resolution, you're going to get tons of objects in there. So think about each object is a NumPy array of the same size of the imagery it's going to be a lot of GPU. So in that case, um, you might need to think about how to do batch segmentation. So same geo has some uh, function allowing you to do segmentation uh, altogether. So give you a large imagery, it's going to uh, subdivide the imagery into smaller types and then do the segmentation on each one and then uh, most the result back as a single geo tip. So they can somehow overcome the limitation of the, uh, the, the, the GPU uh, that if you don't have a large GPU. So hopefully in the future, I can improve that. Um, not every object need to be the same size, the same straight of the original imagery because it's a lot of uh, uh, space, but that's what the same, it's originally output is basically a list of masks and each mask basically the, the same shape um, of the uh, original mask. So, Hopefully it will be better, um, uh, more memory friendly in the future. But for now, this is what we have. So uh, at least you can do some interactive segmentation. You can also do batch segmentation programmatically uh, if you want to. So again, you can try it out um, using the notebook uh, link above. I also created some uh, tutorials. So um, here are some of the uh, tutorials that I created. Uh, in the last month or two. So if you want some detailed instruction on how to run student, you can do that. Uh, I would like to point out, you can also use that, for example, with uh, desktop GS. So you can use ArcGIS Pro. Uh, there are also some uh, uh, tools available there that you can use with QGS. So you, if you if you want to um, integrate some of the results with other data, then you might want to try out um, some desktop GS. But um, in their same geo, I already have a lot of div map uh, interactive functionality, uh, so you can do interactive segmentation, you can save the result interactively without having to write uh, many lines of code. So check out the video. And lastly, I want to quickly mention uh, GMAP that, uh, so GMAP is a cloud company, uh, Google Engine. Uh, so GMAP builds upon Google Engine uh, Python API. Uh, it's open source. Uh, you can uh, check out um, the source code on GitHub. So this is one of the earliest projects that I, 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 I started and about three years ago, probably. And so mostly for doing work on Google Search Engine, uh, cloud computing and mapping. And so Google Search Engine itself doesn't have the segmentation, anything model functionality, um, but it has a lot of imagery. Sometimes you might want to utilize some of the data in Google Search Engine, and then you want to do the segmentation, you then segment anything model, uh, you can do that. So you can check out the, uh, documentation, uh, gmap.org. Uh, there's a tons of uh, documentation tutorial uh, on that. And this is the short paper describing uh, the package. And I was lucky to have some funding from NASA to support the development uh, of the package. So, and specifically for the same model, uh, you can check out tutorial 135. Uh, the link is up there. So what this one is doing is basically use Google Engine and then export the data, download the map tiles, and then create the GOT, and then use the GOT to do the segmentation. So this is technically not really uh, uh, Google sending. It's basically you are getting the data outside the cloud computing platform. Um, but hopefully maybe in the future we can uh, use um, um, 
Google AI platform to host the model and then do the segmentation. So in that way, you don't have to uh, export the data. But for now, this is what uh, it is available. So you can basically um, visualize any Google search imagery. And then um, once you have the visualization parameters, you can just use one line of code to download the imagery as a map tiles, as a GeoTIFF. So in that way, uh, you can use that as an input imagery to do the uh, to do segmentation. So right now, the same model only support RGB. Okay, so satellite data, remote sensing data, sometimes might have multi spectral bands, but it doesn't support it yet. So you can only do RGB. But it doesn't mean that you can only use the real RGB channel. You can use near infrared. You can use swap um, uh, with. You can use any spectral bands you like, and but you just extract those three bands. So if you're trying to do, for example, like trying to segment trees or, or vegetation, if you're using multi-spectral imagery, you can grab the uh, near infrared band and then maybe the red band, the green band, and then use those three bands to do segmentation. So uh, basically, you can visualize the imagery in whatever way you want and then highlight the feature you want and then you export the data and then do the segmentation. So, but there's also a uh, kind of potential workaround is that you do segmentation on multiple bands, right? So you have three bands, RGB, and then you also have a uh, first color composite. You also do the segmentation. Then at the end, you can probably combine the results together to see how uh, they are different or they are very similar. And then you can combine the results together uh, as a workaround if you really want to utilize uh, multi-spectral information in your uh, algorithm. And for GMAP, uh, I also uh, recently published a book. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about Google Search Engine, you can uh, check out the book here. Uh, all the source code is open source. You can check out the link, uh, book.gmap.org. Uh, look at all the source code, the code snippet. Uh, if you want more comprehensive about uh, the, the text and the figures, everything, then you can check out the link on the left to uh, purchase the, uh, the book, Peter Kobe. Uh, the print copy might be uh, available in, in this week or sometime next week. And uh, there's also a SciPy workshop that I presented uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's four hours. So if you want to learn more about Google Engine, uh, you can check out the link. And this is the the video, uh, four hour video of the workshop. So if you want to learn more, this is might be uh, useful for you to get started. But again, it's just, uh, same model integration, just one notebook. So um, for Gmail, I already have 130, uh, 37 or 38 uh, notebooks. So uh, if you want more, learn more, you can check out uh, the website to learn more. And lastly, uh, I, if you want to check out some other open source projects, you can check out the GitHub link here, uh, Open Geospatial Solutions. So I basically move all my packages not all of my packages, some of my packages that um, uh, widely used into this organization. So uh, it's more sustainable. Anyone can contribute. And if one day I disappear, then people can um, take over. The team member can take over and then continue uh, with the packages. But uh, GMAP, uh, Segment G, uh, Geospatial, but there are many other Python packages and R packages and data catalog um, available. So you're welcome to check out uh, the repo and uh, also contributions are welcome. So if you want to contribute, um, uh, let me know, or you can just submit a pull request or issues on uh, GitHub. And that's all. So you can connect with me uh, on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, all kinds of social media. So you can scan a QR code. You can go to the URL, gshub.org uh, to find all my connections uh, on social media. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Wow, thank you so much, Kusang. That was great. Thank you so much. That's a lot of information. Any questions? Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kishing, uh -huh. um, for your presentation. This is this is excellent, and and like I said in the text, I, I can't wait to explore more with what I can do with this uh -huh. uh, this tool. And I really appreciate that you've you've created so many tutorials and other tools to um, help all of us become more familiar with it. Uh, one of the questions I had, of course, because I'm familiar, and I think a lot of us are, with um, 
a lot of the uh, uh, photography tools that are available on our on our handheld devices. This seems similar in and mm -hmm. at least in appearance on the on the first outlook of it mm -hmm. of being able to like select a subject and pull it out. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in some of your examples, like the horse example, I thought was really great. Of course, looking at it, the white horse is sitting out in front, and so you're going to uh -huh. see it differentiate very quickly from from what's going on in the back. Um, and and that the I, I saw the hoof on one of the horses in the background kind of didn't catch the whole horse yeah. um and looking but it still automates an, an, an incredible mountain so I, i'm just excited to play with just wondering how does this algorithm compare with something like that it seems like this is much more computationally intensive is that just because of the amount of data that's being fed into it or is it the the package itself yeah uh, i think kind of yes and no is a computational intensive yes is because we need to know basically the foundation model, the 2.5 gigabyte or the smaller one. And actually right now there are some model that actually like lightweight version, they actually much smaller, but basically right now the model has uh, like 6 million parameters, like it's huge, but people have like built on top of this one, have a much smaller model, but achieve similar performance. So hopefully in the future, uh, we have um, actually already some feature requests on um, the same geo uh, repo that to integrate, uh, there's another one called fast same, uh, light same SQ or something like that. So there are new models available. Uh, this makes it really much smaller. So you don't need to have a very really big GPU to do that. And so there's the computational intensive part. They just load the model into that. And then to the inference, that one is really fast. It's like million seconds. It's like very, very fast. So you can give an image, you can do the segmentation very, very quickly. And that's why if you see um, some of the demo that I, the whole sheet, right? You pick a segment, right? It, there's no really a lag. But of course, if you're doing like remote sensing imagery, it's going to be a lot more complicated. So if your object is much larger, your image resolution much larger, it's going to be a little bit slower. But in general, the most computation intensive part is to load the foundation model into the GPU. And once it's done, you can then re, you can do very quickly. And compared to traditional models, like uh, as I mentioned, you need to train the model. You need to have that. And it's also some, most of the models have very strict requirement what the input should look like, what's the format, what's the uh, architecture. And also um, it's not generalized to do everything. So this is so-called the second anything. This is basically the innovation. This is given imagery and I do it for you. It doesn't matter what imagery it is. Traditional model most of is specific for one domain, for one set of imagery, for example, cats and dogs. It's just going to be able to handle cats and dogs. If you have horses, you have elephant, or something like that, it's there's likely to be able to do that. Uh, of course, there are more like image uh, models that able to segment like anything, some uh, other object, but still, it's fine tuned to that specific one. It's not for everything. So this is why I mean, you people can be on top of that because you have the foundation. You can apply to different domain. Traditional models do not have that. It's tied to a specific domain. If you use an imagery that outside this, the model that string, it cannot do that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I mean, just uh, put in the comment too. I'm very excited to see like animal surveys being done this way, or of course, tree surveys looking at remote sensing imagery, but just being able to differentiate the, the like, penguin chicks that are all standing next to each other and very similar even with the gradient design being able to click that out is, is very exciting. Yeah, so hopefully in the future we have some like uh, foundation model specific for remote sensing imagery for geospatial data. For now we are still using the original same model. It's not fine-tuned but people have developed like fine-tuned the model and then you can get much better result for remote sensing applications. You can uh, take a look at some of the um, the GitHub repo. Actually, the, I, I I don't have time to improve the, all of them, but there are some quite interesting feature requests that uh, including the fine tuning uh, and also integration with some other models. Uh, so you can take a look at. Um, when I have time, I will try to in implement those. And Jacob has a question about the different imagery. Yeah, so it works based on drone imagery, high resolution. I've personally not tested in MODIS, um, but you can try it. As long as you can see the pattern, you might be able to do it, but it's best suited for high resolution. Low resolution, uh, 
eventually the same model is converting all the images into NumPy array. So I know who it doesn't know like actually what the image look like. It's just a bunch of uh, NumPy array. And then it's going to based on the uh, values um, and different um, bands is going to basically do the segmentation, but uh, certain can try, but uh, if you're using MODIS, you probably won't see a lot of pattern. It's basically very continuous and then very close to solution. So I don't think the uh, segmentation would be that good, but try the notebook, you can input any imagery you like, any GeoTIFF, uh, then the algorithm will be able to output. So if you're doing the automatic segmentation, it's basically you have to generate 32 by 32 and then do the segmentation. So you can think about if a human can identify some of the objects on the imagery, the computer probably can, the same model might be able to do that somehow, uh, no profit. Uh, yeah, so any num three number of bands. So basically, the input is three three bands. So basically, at least a numpy array that basically dimension of three, and then uh, width and uh, height. So you cannot use more than that. But maybe in the future we can find a way to do that because essentially you can do three. If you have six bands, you can do three. You can do three and then combine the result together. Uh, it's possible, but it's just not something uh, has native support. Uh, by saying. Any other questions? Yeah, I think Amil has a question on the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're looking to see your thoughts on integrating TensorFlow in GE map. I know there's been some talk around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we are working on that probably next, uh, later this year, next year. So. Right now, um, there's no, it's basically based on the original Python API, uh, also in the Python API, so there's no native uh, integration yet. Um, I usually input the feature that people can use without any additional uh, stuff. But TensorFlow, you need to have the AI platform, you need to pay, so um, not everyone is going to be able to use that. So it's more like for all the fancy users. But there's also something that I'm thinking about that uh, hopefully you'll be able to implement and make it easier for people to use rather than you have to figure out uh, like how to download the image ties, how to do the training, how to create the um, uh, sample data and then export to AI, Google AI platform to do the training, build the model and then pass it back. So it's a lot of like uh, steps being involved. Uh, hopefully in the future, you'll be just given images and do that for you. You don't have to worry about under the hood, how we do all kind of data conversion and import and export stuff. Yeah, I think there's some yeah. interest yeah. here at the server. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Amil, I and uh, team will follow up you on that one uh, mm -hmm. separately. Yeah, sure. And there's another question from a uh, user. Can people upload images? and search for segment anything model? Uh, if you're using the original segment anything model, the answer is no. Uh, as I said, segment anything model doesn't know what it is. It's just a list of regions of objects. But integrating with rounding dyno and or for example, same geo, you can because uh, when you um, do the segmentation, the you already know what label. So you can use text prompt uh, to extract a specific um, feature that you want, but you can also possibly use other packages to already segment. Basically, you already have all the bounding boxes for all the objects that with labels, and then you can use same same geo or use same to segment imagery. So basically, eventually, you want it given imagery, I segment that. I also know all the labels, but this is not going to work very well for geospatial because it looks very different from the original same model but ideally uh, we want to be able to do that um, so that's one thing that i'm thinking about how to implement um, it's feasible so basically multi-class classification so i give you imagery right with trees with buildings i'm going to give you the trees and buildings um, but right now it's not available yet um, if anyone want to contribute you're welcome to i'm thinking about that uh, how to do that uh, at least 
for the point, for example, the marker, like uh, you place a marker, building trees, right? I place, I can maybe have an interface allow user to enter, for example, buildings, and then place the markers, exactly the buildings, create another one, trees, and then select the markers and then trees. So eventually you can export a multi um, class segmentation. Um, it's feasible. I just need to find time to uh, implement it. I have one question. So on your uh, paper, you talked about uh, how you, you know, use the SAM and uh, train it with different kind of uh, satellite imagery, including UAV aircraft and other satellite mm -hmm. imagery. So what happens when someone wants to, let's, let's say, text prompt into class that's not already been trained on? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have to go back and train that class or uh, is no, so the text prompt actually is from the grounding dyno. So the grounding dyno already has okay. tons of classification, the labels. So the same doesn't take the label, same only takes the bounding boxes. So if, if you, you can improve other packages, basically is to join the bounding boxes, make the bounding boxes with a label, and then you can classify any object you want. Uh, basically, it's a two-step process, uh, bounding boxes, and then fine tune the bounding boxes to get the objects. And then you can also generate the points. So if you have some markers, you can, with the bounding box and also the marker, the result will be more accurate because if you have like something, let's say a river, um, really elongated, and they have a bounding box is pretty big, and they have other object that uh, has a much larger percentage, sometimes the segment is more the minor extract the river. You might extract trees and buildings, other stuff. So you have the bounding boxes, you have also have the points, uh, you will be better. Uh, Jake, I have another question. Like, can you only use an image that is one bank? It looks like the imagery. Yeah. So there are some uh, people asking a question like, how can I use that to do segmentation of like star imagery? Yeah, because you only have one band. Yeah, technical, you can you can just like one band and then you just copy them, get the three bands together, and then you do the segmentation. But yeah, second for those it is not very good. Uh, you can certainly try it because. Uh, the pattern is not very obvious. So basically, Sam is looking at the pattern. You can segment. If it's very obvious, obvious on your imagery, you can see the bright color, dark color, uh, very distinctive. Then Sam might be able to do that, but it doesn't perform that well uh, compared to uh, RGB imagery. Okay. Any any other questions? I don't see any other question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kuiseng. That was awesome presentation. Uh, I'll uh -huh. upload the video and also the slides. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have any questions? Uh, you can connect with me and uh, on LinkedIn or GitHub or uh, wherever you like. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again in the future. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.